Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another evening of NERV. Uh, we're excited to welcome everyone online. Um, I'm going to just carry on with your introductions. Um, if you can just maybe give an indication in the comments that you can hear me. Um, so my name is Siobhan, and online with me tonight is Julianne. And then you can keep an eye out for Darby in the comments. Um, so we are all part of the neural engineering research venture. And tonight's a very special evening in that we are celebrating um, Alan Turing. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, Alan Turing is hailed as a pioneer of artificial intelligence. Um, he is the inventor of the Tur Turing machine. And it is said by the likes of Winston Churchill that his integral contributions to the um, cracking the Enigma code shortened the um, Second World War by at least two years. Um, before we get into the talk, I'm just going to run through a few announcements. Um, there are some really exciting things happening. Um, the Rhodes Scholarships have been expanded to include many more countries. So please check your eligibility, especially if you were born after 1996. Um, and these applications close the end of next month. The Deep Learning in Daba has launched a grand challenge. Definitely check this out. Um, it's all about um, cure, uh, repurposing drugs. And there is funding and mentorship available. The University of Tübingen is um, hosting an online machine learning summer school. And then DeepMind, in collaboration with University College London, London have released a lecture series in machine learning. Um, in, in joining us tonight, um, we just ask that you remember that there's a diverse background. Everyone um, has. So please use respectful and inclusive language um, to ensure that everyone has a good evening. Um, if you want to ask a question, please post your questions in the ask a question feature. And then remember to vote for your favorite question. Um, these will be asked at the end. Um, so the most popular questions will be asked first. And if you aren't able to come up on screen, although we would love to have you join us, then please just add please ask to the question and then we will ask on your behalf. If your connection is slow, the best thing to do is try refresh your browser. And if your connection does fail, um, the talk will be available to stream after the event at the same link. And now I will hand over to Julianne and she will introduce our speaker. Hi everyone, welcome to another Nerve and especially a warm welcome to our speaker for this evening, Sebastian Bodenstein. Sebastian joined the Wolfram Research Machine Learning Team after finishing his PhD in theoretical physics in 2013. There, he was one of the two main developers of the Mathematica deep learning framework. He is currently on a research sabbatical with a particular interest in model-based reinforcement learning. He also implemented AlphaZero for the DeepMind OpenSpiel package. So very welcome, Sebastian, and thank you so much for being our speaker this evening. Cool, pleasure to be here. So let me share my screen. And okay. There we go. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so I gave a variation of this talk uh, earlier a few months ago uh, to another meetup. So for those who've been to that one already, I do apologize for some of the duplication in the talks. OK, so I want to first outline roughly where this is going to be going, just so you have some idea, and what I want to achieve with this talk. So what I like with talks is to basically have give some big ideas that will stay with you. So basically not focusing too much on, on too many details because you'll probably forget those. Uh, but basically, yeah, have some big ideas for how things like AlphaZero work and kind of a, yeah, a comparison of how it, were, how it relates to things like uh, human cognition. So our journey is going to start with a very famous book by a Nobel Prize winning economist called Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. So he popularized this idea that the human mind has two distinct modes of operation. 
So the one mode of operation is what he calls system one. And the second one is system two, very boring names. And the very basic uh, simple idea is that system one, it operates pretty much automatically. It doesn't require any conscious attention uh, or yeah, conscious effort at all. So something like, you know, if we saw a dog walking by, we can recognize that it's a dog without any, you know, conscious effort on our part. And then there's a very different part, which is system two, which allocates attention and conscious uh, sort of thought to a problem. And we'll see kind of what I mean by this now. So yeah, Kahneman's definition was system one operates automatically and quickly with little or no effort and no sense of voluntary control. System two allocates attention to the effortful men mental activities that demand it, including complex computations. The operations of system two are often associated with subjective experience of agency, choice, and concentration. So a simple example is if we're doing arithmetic. So if I see five plus five, there's no conscious effort required on my part. Because I've done it so many times, it just is intuitive that it's 10. Like there's no, I don't have to think about the axioms of, of how, you know, uh, addition works. It just is pretty, you know, I know exactly that it's 10 because I've seen it many, many times. So this is kind of how system one works. It's an intuition uh, that works immediately and instantly. Well, system two, if you give me a much bigger uh, addition sum of this, then suddenly I can't just intuitively tell you what the result is. There do exist some people who can do that, uh, but for the vast majority of humans, yeah, you can't just look at that and tell me what the answer is. So system two allows me to consciously reflect about how numbers work, how addition works, and then slowly figure out how to add these two numbers. And this requires conscious effort. It's hard for me to do. It's not just automatic. Okay, so one of the key things that people have realized is, or where there's a growing recognition about, is that deep learning systems are currently stuck very much in system one. So a neural network, it basically, if, it's, if it classifies something as a, let's say as a dog, it takes one look at the dog, it, has the, it takes the input in once, it does some processing on it and it spits out an answer. Uh, so it has no way of reflecting about things. So as an example of this, uh, for system two, suppose you're doing machine translation. So in machine translation, some sentences might be very hard to translate from one language to another. And you might require a lot more computation and a lot more thought for how to do this. But deep learning systems don't work like that. They can't allocate more thought for a harder problem. They, it's a single neural network. It looks at it once, sentence, and it spits out the first result that basically comes to its mind. So that's that's kind of the yeah the reason why deep learning is system one. It has no possibility really for using introspection to do more computation for a harder problem. Whatever the problem is, you know, if the neural network takes the image or sentence or whatever else it is and just spits out an answer. So system two is where some people like Yosha Bengio argue is the key sort of next step to make real artificial intelligence. Uh, and why is that? So what things are missing that current neural network systems, uh, yeah, what, what sort of limitations will that lift from current systems, I guess? So the main one is the following. There's a whole bunch of things it can do, but this one is maybe the, yeah, the one that's easiest to explain. So one of the big problems with deep learning and machine learning in general is a particular assumption that it makes. So this assumption is that the tests and training sets are sampled from the same distribution. So this assumption is violated all the time. In fact, for real applications, it's almost impossible to find uh, a training set that is the same as the test set. So as a, as a random example for just to see how things go wrong, suppose I was to make a classifier that would classify images, MNIST digits, as either bigger than five or smaller than five. So these digits here, yeah, the ones that are smaller than are red, and the ones that are greater than or equal to five are green. So suppose I built this classifier, 
And now I want to try it out. So if I now give it a, an eight that is red, what will happen? And the answer is from neural networks to random forests to SVMs, it doesn't really matter what technique you use. It will usually tell you that this eight is smaller than five because what the classifier has done is it said, you've given me a problem. You've said that the distribution is gonna be exactly the same for the test set. So I can use any possible feature that I want for determining you know, whether something is bigger or smaller than five. Uh, and in this case, the color is the easiest thing. You know, it correlates perfectly. So why can't I just use the color? Uh, but for humans, we can look at this. And even if we've only seen you know, digits of a certain color, we're very adept at, uh, at saying, OK, but we can also recognize other parts of this and see that it's actually, you know, this is a two or this is a four, even if we've never seen digits of that, that sort with that color. So you might say, oh, but this is just some academic thing. You know, even if it's, maybe if it's similar. So in the real world, you might have, you might say, okay, you know, as long as the, the pictures, if it's similar colors in the training set and we have similar colors in the, the test set, we're all good. But it turns out that you're not. So one of the most spectacular examples of this are adversarial examples. So you've trained it on some distribution of images. Uh, some image classifier on ImageNet. And you can take a picture of a panda and then add some noise, but add just a tiny bit of noise. So this is the noise image, and we're going to multiply this by 0, 0,007. So it doesn't affect the pixels too much of the panda, right? And in fact, this is what it looks like when we add this noise. It looks exactly the same to the human eye. But the neural network, it is now almost 100% confident that this is a gibbon, which is this monkey over here. So this assumption that we, we use the same uh, test set as training set, we can violate this in a very simple way, which is just adding a bit of noise. This noise was never seen during training. And that tiny violation that has no perceptible uh, impact on the final, you know, what it looks like to a human, that completely changes what the classifier does. So this whole thing is a huge problem for neural networks at the moment. Uh, as soon as you have distributions or you're trying to use it in situations that are outside of the training distribution, they can completely fail in terrible ways. But humans are very good at this. So just one more sort of humorous example is this sort of thing. Uh, what is this? <laughs> So in this case, this dog looks very much like a zebra. And if you try this to put this into an image classifier, it will say it's a zebra. And but humans, they can use a system to process. If you if you saw this, if you just glanced at this, this animal, if you had one frame and you said, okay, what is this? And you just had, you know, you, your instantaneous thought would be, oh, this is a zebra. But when you enlist the help of your system two processes, you can start asking th questions about this. Like one is, okay, this thing is maybe, you know, this dog is quite quite small compared to how big a zebra might be. Uh, you can ask things, questions about priors. Like, is this a reasonable thing that humans might do to their poor animals? And we know that humans do all kinds of crazy things to the animals. So suddenly we can use larger or larger thought processes, which are part of system two, to figure out what is actually going on here. Even though, you know, if you're training an image classifier, it will never see something like this. So we're able to uh, extrapolate beyond the sort of training distribution that we've seen for, uh, yeah, for things. Okay, so that's the motivation for and we'll get back to this at the end of why system two uh, is particularly useful for this. But this is the setting. So we, we're at the moment, we're at the stage where we say that these two systems, 
And neural networks and deep learning are mostly stuck at system one. And the question is, yeah, what do you get if you have a system two part that is part of it as well? And so I want to just give an overview of how alpha zero and alpha go work. And what's interesting about the system is that it is it uses both system one and system two components to spectacular effect. So as you probably know, like AlphaGo, it solved or beat the world champion at the game of Go, was the first program that did that. And um, later on, there was an update of that of a zero, which did the same thing for chess. So it beats the best chess humans, but also best chess computers. So this is one of the sort of shining examples of success in AI. And it's very interesting that it uses both of these components, which we'll see now. OK, so that's where we're going to go. So the next step, though, is to look at how alpha zero actually works. Uh, and also, yeah, I'd recommend this documentary if anyone hasn't seen it yet. It's a really fun, uh, fun look at behind the scenes of how uh, AlphaGo was made and how it was, yeah, how the match unfolded against Lisa Dole. OK, so how do you play a game like chess or Go? Like, what is the, the tactic that you might use? How would you build a computer that could play it? So the naive solution is to try every single possible move. So this is called a game tree. So at every position, so this, this represents a position at the top. And there's different moves that you could do at that position. And then every, every time that you make a move, your opponent can make some other set of moves. And if you want to find the best move, uh, by some definition of best, you'd have to try all the possible moves. And there's a very simple algorithm that takes like 10 lines of Python that you can implement the entire, yeah, this entire solution for games like chess or Go that looks through everything. The problem is that these games have completely unmanageable numbers of positions. So something like Go has 10 to the 170 different board positions. Uh, and there's only yeah, 10 to the 82 atoms in the observable universe. So even if you had one atom per bit of information to store all the board positions or something, it would you could never do it. Uh, in fact, it would take of the order of trillions of years to uh, yeah to try go through each position or each each board position with modern computers. So the other difficulty is that you only have a single reward signal. So you only the only information you have whether you're playing well or badly is that you either win, lose, or draw the game at the end of the game. OK, so chess is very similar. You also can't brute force it. There's too many positions. And so modern chess computers use all sorts of heuristics for reducing the search space. So this is Stockfish, which was the current or the previous uh, computer world chess champion. And you can sort of see some of the techniques that they might use. Now, what's incredible is that AlphaZero is, you can implement it in very, very few lines of code, uh, maybe you know, of the order of 50 to 100 lines, maybe let's say 100. You, it uses absolutely no specific information about chess or Go, but the same algorithm will, you know, is better than using all these heuristics. So also just one, one thing that's maybe useful to know about is just where DeepMind has been going with this stuff. So originally in 2016, there was AlphaGo. Then there was AlphaGo Zero, which removed the need to first train the stuff on human games. And then AlphaZero generalized to work on chess and uh, Shogi. And finally, quite recently, there was MuZero, which we'll see a bit later what that is. OK, so how does it work? So there's basically going to be three major ideas for how AlphaZero works. And I'm going to just go through them uh, to give you the high-level ideas of what, yeah, how this, how this whole thing works. So the first thing is, suppose we have a magic function. So this magic function f of theta takes in the board position of chess or go or whatever other game. And it returns two things. It returns a probability distribution of all the actions. And it tells you what actions are the most likely to be good. And it tells you, it predicts the v, uh, the value, 
what the outcome of the game would be if you're in the current state. So one question is, how would you even produce a function like this, right? Like this is a magic function. Uh, one obvious way is to say, let's take human games. So we have you know thousands and thousands of games that humans have played, and we can feed in the states at every board position that these grandmasters play, and we can predict, uh, you know, what 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 move will the grandmaster make next, and that will give us the p, and this is called uh, the policy. And the same thing, you know, if the grandmaster eventually lost the game, the value would be zero. If he drew the game, it would be half. Uh, if he won the game, it's one. So we could try to predict what the outcome, the final outcome, would have been from that position. This is what what AlphaGo did in the beginning. But Alpha Zero uh, avoids this training on human games. We'll see a different way of doing it now. OK, so we have this magic function. And this is the key thing to have. And this is obviously a neural network, the, the uh, f of theta. So what do we get if we have such a magic function that for any possible state or any other possible board position that gives us you know, possible moves to try that are good, it allows us to do two things with the search tree. The first thing is that we can use the policy to look at the actions that are the most likely to be good. So if you have a distribution of all actions, then we can investigate the ones that uh, are the most promising to the neural network. And this, yeah, this is called reducing the width of the search tree because we can just look at the most promising moves. Then we can also uh, reduce the depth of the tree with the value function. Because for any state that we've got, uh, with a usual game, the results, the only information we have about results comes right at the end. But with the value function, we can say, oh, let's let's try the search tree for you know five steps down. For and then instead of using the actual result, we can just truncate it with the approximate value, which our neural network is giving us. So this now fundamentally changes the size of the search tree, right? Because we can. Uh, yeah, it's going to be much less deep and it's going to be much less wide. So the formalization of this is something called Monte Carlo tree search. And the algorithm is actually very simple. So all it does is it starts with a selection phase. So, so the high level concept is that you want to explore possible moves. And you explore based on two criterion. So one criterion is what is your neural network telling you are the best moves? So you want to try those ones preferably. And you also want to try moves that haven't been tried before to like explore the space a bit. So there's a, there's a particular algorithm for weighing up exploration versus exploitation, uh, which are, yeah, I'm not getting into detail for that. But basically, it wants to try nodes that, yeah, with a, the neural network tells it these are the best actions to try. And it builds up a tree of the most plausible moves uh, piece by piece. And this is sort of the, the loop that it goes into. Uh, and it, it, it gradually explores and builds out a tree of, of possible moves that are the most plausible. And it uses the information that it gets from those to re-estimate what the policy actually is. So instead of just using the policy that was used in the beginning, it uses this new search graph to estimate uh, yeah, what, what a better policy will look like. So this is this p hat. It's a new better policy that takes into account looking into the future. So for example, in chess, you know, it might have some intuition for what the best move is, but it might, by doing the search, it might realize that there's a checkmate in its future quite quickly. That it just didn't, you know, its intuition didn't give it uh, that that idea, so its intuition failed it. So it allows it to correct the mistakes that intuition can sometimes make. Okay, so so this is the key thing. So we've now had instead of having a massive search graph that is completely intractable, it will take longer than the probably the heat death of the universe. We now have a much smaller graph that we can look at, and all we're claiming is that we're improving the results a bit by looking ahead in this graph. That's all we're doing. It's just better than what it would have been without looking ahead. But it's not looking at the entire graph. OK, so this is the first thing. Now AlphaZero has a very cool idea. 
And this is really the key to the entire algorithm. So the problem with, with reinforcement learning is that you have this, you have a single reward right at the end of training, right? Of playing a game. So with supervised learning, it's quite different. You have for every single example, you have some label. So you have some bit of information that the label gives you. But in this case, there's only one label. And all the actions that you've taken in the entire game, you have to figure, or the neural, the neural network training has to figure out which of those actions was responsible for me winning or losing. This is called the credit assignment problem. And it's incredibly hard for something like Go. You play hundreds of moves, and the only signal you get is after the hundreds of moves, you either win or lose the game. Like, which move was responsible for that? Who knows? It's very, very hard to tell. So AlphaZero had a very clever solution to this, which is to say, OK, we have a procedure for improving the policy by searching ahead. So let's train a neural network that, so that the, the policy that the neural network predicts is the same as the one that the Monte Carlo tree search predicts, the p hat. And this loss function here is just, uh, the first term is that, so z is the final result of the game. So we want the value to match the final result, just regression. And the second one is just cross entropy loss. It's saying, make the, yeah, make the predicted probability be the same as MCTS. So what it's learning to do is it's learning what would have happened if you did search as well. So it's learning to search in some, some sense. And this idea was came about uh, at the similar time by another group. And they had a slightly different take on it, which is expert iteration. It's exactly the same idea. And you just say the Monte Carlo tree search is basically an expert. It's better than the apprentice. And the uh, apprentice needs to learn what the expert is doing, right? The expert makes a move based on looking ahead, and the apprentice, which is just the pure neural network, it has to predict, yeah, what that expert will do. And it's highly non-trivial signal because the Monte Carlo tree search does, you know, it looks ahead hundreds of moves, and it, uh, yeah, it's a it's a very complicated thing for the network to learn. So it's a highly non-trivial signal that you get at every stage, at every for, sorry for every action that you take. Because for every action, you do a Monte Carlo tree search, and you have now a new policy that you use to do that action. So you basically just bootstrap this process. Uh, you know, the, the expert also uses, I guess, the, uh, the apprentice network to improve itself. And then that gets fed back into, yeah, the apprentice learning what the expert did. So this is really the key idea. And it's quite similar to how humans do things as well. So. When learning to complete a challenging planning task, such as playing a board game, humans exploit both processes. Strong intuitions allow for more effective analytic reasoning, but rapidly selecting interesting lines of play for consideration. Repeated deep study gradually improves intuitions. So strong intuitions feed back to stronger analysis, creating a closed learning loop. In other words, humans learn by thinking fast and slow. So this is precisely what, what's happening here. Uh, there are these two processes. There's a system one process, the neural network, uh, that just has an intuition of what the right moves are. But that intuition is absolutely critical to guide the search. Because the search, without that uh, level one or system one intuition, the search space is vastly too large. And chess players, human chess players, think in a very similar way. And we'll see this just a bit later. OK, so there's one more idea that is interesting uh, that maybe people don't appreciate enough. Uh, so if, you, if you're doing multi-agent reinforcement learning, so if you're trying to build, let's say, a Go computer or a chess computer, uh, you can phrase it in two different ways. So one is if you have a fixed opponent. So if you have, let's say, a chess computer and you want to learn how to beat it, you could try to train that as a normal reinforcement learning problem. But if you want to create something that's vastly stronger than the best human or the best machine that you've got to play against, you need some way for uh, for the agent, for, yeah, for you to create agents for the agent to play against, right? And in the beginning, you've got nothing. You've only got the rules of the game. So how how do you start uh, training something? 
so the idea is called self-play. Uh, and this, this quote is quite nice that sort of mentions this. Uh, modern machine learning algorithms are outstanding test takers. Once a problem is packaged into a suitable objective, deep reinforcement learning algorithms often find a good solution. However, in many multi-agent domains, the question of what test to take or what objective to optimize is not clear. Learning in games is often conservatively formulated as training agents that tie or beat an, an average fixed set of opponents. However, the dual task that of generating useful opponents to train and evaluate against is unstudied. It is not enough to beat the agents you know, it is also important to generate better opponents, which exhibit behaviors you don't know. So AlphaZero makes one massive assumption that allows it to use self-play. And we'll get to what self-play is now. now. But there's basically two kinds of games. There's transitive games and there's intransitive games. So transitive games like chess or Go, uh, the, the basic idea is that you can have strategies that get uniformly better. So if I do, if I'm a grandmaster, uh, I could beat, you know, and if I have a set of strategies, I could be, I could beat, uh, you know, everyone that's sort of ranked below me. So this doesn't happen with things like intransitive games, like rock, paper, scissors. In that case, you have strategies that will always be beaten by some other strategy. Uh, so for example, yeah, rock, paper, scissors, like rock beats scissors, and scissors beats paper, and pe paper beats rock. So whatever strategy you take, there's a counter strategy to it. In chess, that's not the case. There is an optimal strategy in chess, and the same thing with Go. So games with this optimal sort of strategy property is what Alpha Zero can can do, uh, can be used for. So th the algorithm is actually incredibly simple. This is basically the heart of, of Alpha, Zero, uh, Alpha Zero. So you start with this neural network. Uh, obviously, in the beginning, it's just random weights. And you use this neural network to play against itself. So because at every position, it can generate a policy uh, that gives you probability of the moves, you can just take the max move. You can say, here's the, the best move, use that one. And then you use the same network for the opponent. And so you can basically play an entire game uh, with this, this neural network. So you've played this game, and you also obviously use Monte Carlo Tree Search to improve the policy, and you use that improved policy to play. And once you've played, you have this data. You have what the final result of the game was, and you have the information about how Monte Carlo Tree Search differed from the prediction you made with just the pure network. And that's it. You update the, the network with this loss, uh, L of zero, and you produce another network, F2. And because we, we're only looking at transitive games, we have this property that, uh, that Fn will beat each of these, like F1, F2, et cetera. Because, yeah, if, if, if F2 is stronger than F1, and if three is stronger than F2, uh, then F3 will be stronger than F1 by this sort of transitivity property. Okay, so that's basically it. That's that's all that alpha zero does. And it just repeats this in a loop. So there's one more thing that, okay, actually, sorry, I forgot about this one. So some things, some games like StarCraft or Rock, Paper, Scissors, they're not, uh, they're not transitive. And so you can't use alpha zero algorithm directly. So when DeepMind was building uh, a StarCraft playing AI, they had to deal with this problem that how do you create interesting opponents in a cyclic game set scenario? And this is much, much harder. Uh, I won't go into all the details here, but they basically were forced to use humans to bootstrap uh, and to learn different strategies from. It's still a completely open problem of how to solve this in general, like how to create interesting opponents uh, when you don't have transitivity. OK. So we've looked at alpha zero and how simple it is. Uh, there's one more important sort of insight that alpha zero has, which is that if you don't have a model of the environment, so for something like chess or Go, uh, we have we know exactly what the rules are for the game, right? Uh, and AlphaZero knows exactly what the rules are for the game. 
And it uses those rules to be able to look ahead and plan and say, if I did this, what will happen? So one of the key things is that most reinforcement learning problems don't have a uh, explicit exact model of the environment, right? Like if you have a robot, the world is extremely complicated. We, you're never going to be given a, an actual model of the world. So a key thing is, can you learn what this model looks like? And one very cool result that DeepMind had that improved AlphaZero was to say, can we learn Go and chess if we don't tell it the rules? It just knows, uh, you know, these are the actions potentially, and it has to learn what those rules are by itself. And this was uh, incredibly successful. They also used it for things like Atari games. Um, and yes, it works. It, it massively improves uh, our normal reinforcement learning, having the ability to plan with Monte Carlo tree search with the, a learned model of the environment. Uh, there's some actually very cool work recently that's also happened with Pac-Man with Gantz, um, where basically you can learn to, sim to emulate the entire game uh, with with a generative adversarial network. So there's a huge movement at the moment towards how do we learn environments? How do we learn the rules of the environments so that we can use those rules like a human would do and try and plan into the future with those rules? So something like Pac-Man, it's particularly powerful because uh, you know planning, if you get into a corner where there's agents that are blocking you somehow, you will die. So being able to look many steps ahead and try and anticipate what those those uh, I don't know what that what they're called, but the baddies uh, might do, that is an incredibly powerful thing. And with Mu Zero, it was shown yeah, that uh, yeah, doing this this the search uh, with this model of the environment, it has dramatic performance improvements over just using Q learning or some other reinforcement learning technique that doesn't use models and planning. Okay, so just to summarize what those major ideas were. So idea one was that we were reducing the search space with policy, the policy value neural network. Uh, but this critically needs the rules and a model of the environment. Without that, we can't do any forward planning. Uh, and these can be learned with, with Mu0. Then the second thing is that we use the results of this sort of system two process MCTS we can use that as a training objective, which gives us, uh, which makes the, uh, which gives vastly stronger training signal than just using the final result of the game. And the final thing is, yeah, we use soft play to generate the training data, which is just playing the neural network against itself, and then using that data to update the, the network and just repeat again and again until it gets better, better, better. And then the final thing is that Mu0 showed was that Monte Carlo tree search with this learned model of the environment, it works very well. Okay, so what about humans? So chess has often been called, or Kasper, for example, has called it the drosophilia of reasoning. Uh, drosophilia is the fruit fly, and it's kind of like the, the standard thing that genetic studies and whatnot are done on. And in fact, the initiator of studying chess was uh, Alan Turing himself. So he had, I think he, he, I think he was the first person to write a chess computer. Um, and obviously it wasn't very good. I don't know if it was implemented even on a real machine, but he had an algorithm for, for doing this. So from the very inception of computer programming and sort of AI, chess has been a sort of very interesting lab for that we can study both humans and also machines in. So what about humans? How important is system one and system two for something like chess? So it turns out that system one is incredibly, incredibly powerful for human grandmasters. So there was an experiment that was done by two Nobel Prize winning economists, uh, Gobey and someone else, uh, where they basically took Garry Kasparov at the height of his in his prime in the uh, 90s, when he was still world champion. And they said, OK, how do we test this out? How can we limit his system two thinking? So the first thing is they limited him to 30 move, 30 seconds move. And then they made him play lots of opponents at the same time. 
And what that does is it means that he can't think during someone else's turn. Um, so because he goes from board to board, uh, he always is, yeah, he, he can never use the opponent's time to, yeah, to cheat and, and to think ahead. So what happens? Like how much weaker did he become as a chess player? So from this experiment, they found, uh, so the first thing is how many, you know, how, how many moves ahead can people sort of look at like grandmasters? Like they're not superhumans. They have a very strong limit to how much they can, can do. So in this case, uh, the chess master might examine a hundred branches of the game tree in 15 minutes, an average rate of about nine seconds per branch. Uh, did Cruet found that stronger and weaker players examine nearly the same number of branches, but that stronger players select more relevant and important branches. The simultaneous player with only 30 seconds, say for a move, will have little time for extensive look ahead search at nine seconds per branch, and will have to depend primarily on recognition of cues to select the right moves. So with Kasparov, his ELO rating went from 2,750 to 2,650. And that rating is still, probably it was at the time, in the top 12 players in the world, which is crazy. Like there's huge numbers of grandmasters that are playing. And even with no look ahead search, and the other players had like three minutes to think, uh, he was still probably in the top 10 players. So this shows something interesting. It shows that system one, even for humans, is the dominant, yeah, is the dominantly important sort of system for playing something like chess. You can play extremely powerfully without any sort of conscious thought. Um, and what about Alpha Zero? So unfortunately, Alpha Zero didn't uh, release data about how strong their chess player was without Monte Carlo tree search, but they did do this for Go. So in this case, the raw network is the one without Monte Carlo tree search. And AlphaGo Zero is the, the Go version of Alpha Zero. And you can see there's a quite a substantial drop in ELO rating. But even the raw network, so that's just the policy value network that has no Monte Carlo tree search in it. Uh, it's still better, like vastly better than the best previous uh, Go playing software, which was called Crazy Stone. And even it's the same strength as AlphaGo Fan, which was the first sort of AlphaGo iteration to beat a human professional player. I think he was the European champion uh, fan. So despite there being quite a big drop, we can still see that just the pure system one neural network has quite a bit of power for playing Go. And one just last thing to see is, uh, so with human grandmasters, Experiments have shown, yeah, it's like maybe a few hundreds of moves they can consider at a time with their system two process. Uh, Alpha zero, it's of the order of yeah, tens of thousands of moves, but it's vastly, vastly smaller than like state of the art chess engines, which are of the order of like tens of millions of moves that they look ahead. So Alpha zero is much closer to how a human might work, but it's still quite different and quite far away from, uh, yeah, how a grandmaster might approach it, because grandmasters just cannot do, you know, tens of thousands of moves ahead. It's impossible. Um, okay, so to conclude, uh, just to reiterate these lessons one last time. So, and this is just purely for alpha zero. This is not necessarily true for all possible system two and system one things for humans, but at least for, for playing games like this, there's some very interesting things that you can learn from, uh, from Alpha Zero. So having access to system two produces or process strengthens play and provides a training signal. This is a very, very key thing, I think. Uh, and humans are, as we've mentioned, do something very similar. Then having a model environment is critical for system two. Uh, without, yeah, without an, a, a way of simulating what will happen in the future, it's not clear how system two can function. Uh, so I think this means that things like model-based reinforcement learning are gonna be more and more important because learning models in environments seems key to actually planning in those environments. And also for humans, we know for, that ourselves, we have very strong uh, sort of internal models of how 
the world works. We can imagine, you know, if you're throwing a ball, we can imagine what will happen to it. Or sportsmen often, you know, they pre-visualize what various actions will, ha will do in the game. Uh, we have very strong ways of, for driving. We can think about all the possible scenarios that might go wrong if we do if we drive in a certain way. Maybe a kid will run out of the driving way, or maybe there's, uh, yeah, maybe the, the tire will burst, and rather, so we should be driving slowly. So the next thing is that system one is not independent from system two. It is absolutely essential to have a good system one to guide system two's explicit conscious deliberations about things. Like the space for most things in the world is vastly too large. We need to bias that search or that system two in a direction that is most likely to be true or to be good. So without biases, basically system two is almost useless in, in, in many situations because yeah, it just cannot hope to, to look at every possible scenario. Uh, oops, the last one is the same. So one more thing is if you are interested in the stuff in Alpha Zero and how it works uh, and want to find out more, I definitely, yeah, I recommend looking at a blog post that I wrote recently. It goes into much more detail. Uh, otherwise, yeah, thank you so much. And I hope you at least learned something from that. Thank you so much, Sebastian. That was a very, very interesting talk. Um, so it seems we do have some questions here. So I'm just going to give all the attendees a couple more moments just to get their questions posted before we start answering them. OK. And then um, just as a point of confirmation, for all the attendees that posted questions, I assume that you will be coming on screen to ask your questions. If not, can you maybe just um, post a comment saying that you you want us to want us to ask the questions on your behalf instead? Okay, then we'll get started with our questions. Uh, sorry, am I, should I be reading them or are you? No, 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 we're just waiting. I'm, I'm waiting for the first attendee to come online. They are accepting the on-screen invitation now. So they should be on momentarily. Cool. Okay, so the first question um, I'm going to read out so long. Um, it is from, from Tima, who is currently accepting and connecting. So we'll see if they are able to come on screen. Um, and the question says, do the two heads of the neural network share the same weights in alpha zero? And can you explain the self-play again? Okay, so Tima is saying the invitation sure. is not working. So I'm just going to leave it to you to answer then. Sure. So for alpha zero it was sorry for alpha go it was two separate networks i believe but alpha zero it was just sharing the weights uh which i guess was it, yeah it, it's better for various reasons like one is that for practical purposes the bottleneck the computational bottleneck is doing these monte carlo searches and for every single possibility in the future you have to evaluate the neural network and so if you can share the computation and just do one single evaluation that like doubles the speed of the uh, of the training. Then self-play, the idea is very simple. It's that if you have this policy value network, you can ask the policy network, policy value network for a particular board position to say, what is the best move? And 
uh, or you can use that with with, MC, with Monte Carlo Tree Search to come up with what the best move is. So use that best move, use the same procedure for the opponent, and so on and so forth. So that is play each other um, until the end of the game. And so that's what, what self-play is. Uh, so you're just using the same network to play itself, basically. OK, perfect. Um, then the second question we have here is from Hanu. And he is asking that we ask the question on his behalf. So he wants to know, have we seen this technology used in domains other than game playing? So AlphaZero has been used in some quantum computing work, I believe, uh, for finding optimal algorithms, I think. I don't know exactly. I can paste the, the references if, yeah, <laughs> if people are interested. And for quantum chemistry, I believe, as well. So, uh, but I guess the thing with, uh, with AlphaZero is that because of the, the, the strong restriction that you need to know the rules of the environment, uh, you can only use it for things like games where you have the rules. So I think like mu zero is, you know, it's been used for, for other things uh, because it learns what the rules are. Okay, perfect. Um, then we have Siobhan on to ask the rest of the questions um, that we will be asking on attendees' behalf. So the first one up is from Darby. Okay. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so Darby's question is. Um, do you have any opinion on machine consciousness and what is needed to achieve machine consciousness? Is a system too necessary for consciousness? So there's two different definitions that people use of consciousness. So, and people confuse, well, people confuse them all the time. So I'm not sure what, which part of consciousness he means. So the one part is the sort of cognitive process that allocates attention to certain things, right? Uh, it allocates attention to certain pieces of information that you can consider at, at a particular time. Uh, there's that. And that case, and sorry, the, the other part of consciousness that people often mean by it is sentience. So this subjective feeling of uh, existing, like, you know, we experience things like pain. People often call that consciousness, uh, but it's a very different thing. And it's almost... Yeah, the problem of explaining that is completely, like many people, very famous scientists believe it's, it'll never happen. Like people can never explain that, uh, the mysterian position. But the other part is, yeah, it's very, uh, if you want to have machine learning systems, and when people like Yoshio Benjo talk of consciousness, they mean the first one. They mean this, this system that can allocate attention and that can uh, give more computation when it's needed to problems. So if you're doing a very hard maths problem, you could spend a whole day doing it. Uh, so this, that thing, absolutely, like that's what this sort of system is what's needed for, uh, yeah, for neural networks or for, for machine learning to, to match what humans do in many domains. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Stephen, and he asks, humans can break and rebuild the rules or believe? How, if ever, could AI systems rebuild system one? Interesting. So. Oh, and then just quick add on without dying or destroying, destroying the neural network. <laughs> uh, OK, so this. OK, so I guess there's a few things here. So one is, it's a, one of the major problems in, with neural networks. So there's, there's a whole bunch of like grand challenges that have to be resolved in the, yeah, in the future. And one of those is called transfer learning. So I'll, I'll interpret your question as, as meaning that. So how do you make, for example, like the AlphaGo or the AlphaZero network that plays chess, how can you make use of that train network to at least, you know, have a start to doing better at Go uh, or some other rule set. So at the moment, you have to break it completely and just start from scratch, like from random parameters. But humans are not like that. They can learn Go and chess in vastly faster time in terms of the number of games they play with, with themselves or others. Uh, so it's a very good question. Like, how do we, yeah, how do we 
use a train network on, on Go and make that work on uh, on some other rule set. So I think that's yeah, it's a very it's an unsolved problem. It's a famous problem in reinforcement learning, uh, and it's it's key to have human level level intelligence and to have things like reinforcement learning work in real world environments like robotics, where we can't sample, we can't just play the game, you know, billions or trillions of times. So the other question was, how can it come up with its own sort of rules and things of the sort? Uh, I mean, how do humans come up with it? So I don't, I'm not quite sure. Like we, there's certain types of games and certain types of rule sets that we just enjoy playing. Uh, I don't know what the, the objective would be, you know, like, yeah, to make new new games. Like it's easy to come up with new rule sets, but which ones would the neural networks find interesting? I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I don't really know a good answer to this question. Sorry. <laughs> OK. okay. Our next question is from Brad, and Brad asks if there are any serious alternatives to MC MCTS. Uh, that's a very good question. So, so one obvious alternative is, uh, so this entire procedure that I outlined, like th there's actually a different philosophy that you could take, uh, which is, it's, it's quite similar to Q-learning, where you say there's a certain consistency that you expect. Um, so for example, if I compute the value function at a particular node, and I find, you know, I compute all the actions and I see what the value function is for the next set of nodes, uh, the top value for that should be the same as the one that I've got now, if you have the optimal policy value function. And so you could use that consistency information to as a training signal instead, uh, that's just purely for the training part. So there's like simpler methods for also getting signal uh, because you have this ability of looking ahead and saying that, you know, there should be consistency between my value estimate now and later. And when I don't have a perfect network, it'll be wrong. And that difference can be, you know, something you learn against. But I haven't seen in terms of searching a serious alternative. So it's, and it's hard to see what they would look like. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I've never seen anything different. And in fact, like MCTS was before neural networks came on the scene, it was the, the state of the art for things like Go playing already. So that was like one of the great, uh, revolutions in Go playing computers was when MCTS was discovered, uh, with crazy stone and it just dramatically improved play. And I've never seen any other technique that is vaguely competitive to that. So no. Okay. Our next question is from Ayomide, who asks, in the case of idea one, um, is the policy designed by the engineers? If that is the case, would that mean Mu0 doesn't require design from the engineers? Uh, I'm not sure what that means exactly. So by design, do you mean that we have to decide what that network looks like, like what the architecture looks like, or? Um, I would guess, that would be my guess. Um, maybe if you don't mind just commenting for clarification, um, and then we'll just move to the next question in the meantime and, and circle back to this one. Sure. Um, so... Siobhan, you can so long, you can ask um, David's question on his behalf. He will not be coming on screen. Okay. Um, just give me a second. It should be um, at the top okay, of your so list. It, yeah. um, my refresh rate is so slow at the moment. <laughs> um, but I've got the question. I'm going to ask your question, David. Um, Sebastian, can you please talk to the potential role of quantum computing in the games and other applications from your presentation? For instance, you spoke about the number of moves significantly exceeding the number of atoms in the universe. <sighs> I think there's people on this on this chat who can answer that much better. Uh, I'm looking at a mirror. Uh, <laughs> oh, we should so, get a mirror on screen. That would be. <laughs> so the question, I guess, yeah, is can you get exponential speed ups for um, 
so yeah, I mean, okay, so I guess generally the question is, so quantum computing, the idea is that for certain types of computations, you can get uh, exponential speedups. So things that are in the complexity class where like exponential complexity class, you can move that to like a polynomial class or something. Uh, I have no idea whether there's quantum algorithms that can make MCTS go into a different complexity class. Uh, but also, yeah, all within your networks are faster to evaluate with quantum computers. I've got no idea. <laughs> Sorry. So Amira is the one who should answer though in the in the chat. Sorry. <laughs> um, then for our next question, we will um, be having Dimitri coming on screen. So maybe let's just give him a moment. Um, so Hi, okay. Dimitri. Welcome. Hi, thanks. Thanks for the wonderful talk. It was amazing. I really appreciate it. So I have two questions, more on the technical side, perhaps. Well, this is the first one. So the first one is, can you explicitly somehow control the balance between the systems, between system one and system two, when you do this learning? So, OK, so I guess the question is, yeah, how do you, OK, so one of the high parameters in Alpha Zero is just how many search heads you do, right, in Monte Carlo tree search. So in principle, that could be, it could be different per, like how confident system one is, right? It could say, if system one is like 95% confident that this action is correct, then we're not gonna do much search. Like this is how chess players work because they, you know, when they're on a timer, they basically have to do, go very fast for the moves they're very sure about. Otherwise they can do, you know, a long search if they're very unsure. So that's just a high parameter that you could choose whatever you want. Yeah, but I mean, there are lots of hyperparameters. You can like select I don't know how long do you learn with this neural network or what are the learning rate of this neural network and I can imagine many, many ways of doing it. I just don't know if it makes sense or not and whether everything would something would change if you do something like that. I mean my, my personal experiments on smaller environments was that it was quite robust. Like it doesn't matter too much how deep you search, like it still learns very well. Uh, so like you know, changing the amount of search by orders of magnitude, it didn't do much in my experiments. So it seems very robust, which is a good sign. And also one key thing is that they didn't change high parameters. I think there's only like one or two high parameters that changed between games. So even with things like, yeah, from chess to go to shogi, they use the same, you know, depth of search, the same everything. Okay, awesome, thanks. And the other question is about Mu Zero. So I mean, uh, what you described sounds like really super wonderful, like it already manages to learn basically everything, which is non-cyclic, but I guess it would be a bit too optimistic. So what are the limitations that you didn't mention? So for Alpha Zero? For Musero. So Musero, there's lots of limitations. So I think the major limitation is that Musero doesn't solve the exploration problem. So just to recap, so for environments where you have a reward very, very, very far in the future, uh, where you almost never see the reward, in those situations, I mean, the famous one is Montezuma's Revenge. And you can look at the Musero paper, it fails completely on that. Uh, and so the, the problem is that, OK, so just a small thing about world models and modeling the world with reinforcement learning, there's different approaches you can take. Like one of them is you try and model, you know, you try to reproduce what the pixels of the next uh, frame are going to look like, right? You can say, given this action, what, uh, given the current, let's say, image of the game, what does the next image look like? Uh, and people have had huge difficulties getting this to work well. So Musero took a bit of a, a dodge, which was, to say, we're not going to try to predict at all what the, the next image is. We're only going to predict some latent state that is useful for planning and that, is, that predicts what the next reward is going to be. So it's purely based on rewards, and it, it fails completely when rewards are too far in the future and it doesn't have a signal to learn that, that model. So yeah, Montezuma's Revenge, complete failure. But why, why then it manages to, to learn Go if the reward is also quite far in the future? Okay, so when I say far in the future, I mean that by random play, you'll never see a reward with uh, Montezuma's Revenge. 
Mm. So Go, you always see rewards. Like the maximums, you know, there's a maximum move number at like 300. Whilst Montezuma's Revenge, you can play it for thousands and thousands of moves. If you play randomly, you'll see nothing ever because you have to go through crazy numbers of levels and not die, you know, and then you'll see something. But it, playing that randomly, you'll never see it. Um, Thank you. So, so just uh, Avishka, so the dodge is not the latent state thing. I agree the latent state is perfectly, it's the right thing to predict. And in fact, things that are, like, I think there's like learning to predict is a recent paper by Hafschner. And they also do latent states with a uh, VAE. So in that case, you have a VAE that predicts the next frame, but you still have a latent space that you can use for planning and whatnot. But uh, so latent states are definitely the, probably the right approach, but just the, yeah, the dodge is that using a reward and for environments where you have no rewards, you, have no rewards. you don't get learning. You don't get learning. Sorry, I should be more precise about that. I see. Thanks. Thank you for your questions, Dimitri. Does it answer, Avishka? Okay. Yeah, there's a thumbs up in the comments. <laughs> um, OK, so now we have two more questions left. Let me quickly see what they are. Um, so the next question, Sebastian, is from Khaled, and he wants to know, how can one evaluate the results or to what extent one can rely on the results, particularly for forecasting purposes? For forecasting purposes. Uh, is this for like, so I'm just trying to think of what problem he's trying to, he's thinking of. So is it like, uh, we can maybe ask for some indication in the comments. Yeah, because usually this is like for things like game playing or like reinforcement learning environments, where it's not really about forecasting; it's about controlling. Mm. Uh, you're not like predicting some existing sequence, right? You're predicting because, like, yeah, every input that you get from a reinforcement learning environment is different, and you have to respond to that. It's not like predicting, you know, the weather or something. Mm. So maybe just to yeah clarify what what you mean exactly by that. Yeah, OK, let's leave it at that for now. Um, then the final question this evening from Tima is asking, following up with AlphaZero self-play, with the previous AlphaZero self-play question, how is the policy for the opponent selected in shared weight setting? I guess the main policy is the softmax of the output. So just repeat that one more time. OK, so they're saying, following up with the AlphaZero self-play question from before, how is the policy for the opponent selected in shared weights setting? I guess the main policy is the softmax of the output. So, okay, so this, okay, there's a few things. So one is, yeah, there's a softmax in the output of the um, of the the policy network. Uh, that that policy network is obviously used for both players, so you do share the weights. I guess you could call it that between the player one and player two. Uh, there are some, yeah. So one one maybe thing I should just clarify is that uh, that the policy that policy is only used to guide Monte Carlo tree search, which gives you a new policy, and that's the policy used to play. And one last thing is that yeah, uh, Alpha Zero uses some small detail, which is that even if you have a, a policy. There's two different ways you could potentially get actions from there. So one is you could sample from the softmax, which is what they do for like the first 20 moves, uh, so that there's a bit of extra randomness in the play. And then after 20 moves or something, they take the maximum in the policy of the softmax. So that's how how chooses actions. OK, perfect. Um, yeah, so that then concludes our questions for the evening. Um, yeah, it seems like Amira, Amira posted another response there to the previous question. Um, oh, Thanks, and Amira. There's, a, <laughs> there's <laughs> a comment from Khaled um, that's saying, if I compare observations and would, so on the previous question now, if mm -hmm. I compare observations and would like to simulate to understand what happens that I could not observe, in brackets, space observations, I mainly mean how can I use that for space research for 
ionosphere or forecast any anomalies? Just imagine how sad that happens. Uh, so you'd have to somehow turn this into a reinforcement learning environment. I'm not sure exactly how that would happen. Uh, like, what are you trying to control in this case? Like, what are the actions that you can make with this ionosphere, ionosphere stuff? Uh, but if it's just predicting what will happen in the natural system, then definitely this is not the right. Uh, that I could not observe by the human eyes. Um, maybe can we? F can you send me an email about this, Khaled? We can. Uh, just clarify this question. I'm still slightly confused about, yeah, how Alpha Zero would be used in any in this context. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so that then concludes our our question section for this evening. Um, so, thank you once again, Sebastian. This was a, a very very cool presentation. Um, and I think I can speak on behalf of our audience also when I say that everyone did enjoy it a lot. Um, so let's all so show some appreciation and give Sebastian a virtual round of applause in our comment section over here. And then also thank you to all of you guys for attending um, another NERV event. Um, it's always nice for us to share our Wednesday evenings with you. And then also remember to follow us on Twitter. And Lastly, we would also like to thank our sponsors, Stellenbosch University and the Biomedical Engineering Research Group for making these events possible. And then we will hopefully see all of you again for our next event on the 1st of July. Um, it seems we momentarily lost Siobhan um, this evening. So I think with this, I will then conclude this event and then we will see you all in two weeks time. Thank you and good night. Cool, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.